This is Duke University. So uh, as you can see that by this chart, the, the world population, 1750 to 2150 estimated, there, we're really talking about two different worlds when it comes to population. Uh, you know, as, as I'm sure many of you know, population, total population is declining in much of Europe. It's pretty stable in the United States. Uh, you know, largely uh, gro the growth is due to largely immigration and differential fertility rates for immigrants. Uh, but in many of the developing regions, they have yet to go through a demographic transition, and in particular sub-Saharan Africa, which I'll talk about. W so fertility rates are enormously high, uh, and we're really, uh, in a demographic and then thus in an economic way, becoming well, re uh, two worlds, so to speak. So let's talk about development. So in one way, development, uh, i.e. rising incomes, or wages per capita lead, should lead to uh, differences in fertility rates. On the one hand, uh, well, rising incomes really have this dual effect because to a, to a certain extent, children are a private good and uh, if you can afford more because your incomes have, have risen, you have more So because they are uh, a net cost uh, as anyone with kids knows. Um, but there's also a substitution effect that is, the opportunity when your wages are higher, the opportunity costs of the non-paid labor of uh, child rearing and, and household labor are now, uh, the, the opportunity cost, the substitution effect is greater, and therefore you should shift away from childbearing and that unpaid labor and more towards devoting your time to human capital development and wage labor. So we look for a, a variable that we want to argue is exogenous outside or predates these fertility mortality relationships. And we think we found one in this malaria ecology index. So this is an index constructed based on average rainfall, temperature, altitude, uh, species of mosquito. Ironically, you know, it's the most fertile river valleys that also have the highest disease burdens in Africa. They have uh, yellow fever, malaria, and so forth. Uh, other diseases I can't pronounce. So, um, so the most, the safest lands to occupy are actually the least fertile lands. So this is a paradox or a, a problem. And to, to, to skip forward about economic development, it also keeps you farther and farther away from global markets because you need to be at the ports to access global markets and, and engage in trade. So this sort of malaria ecology has, an enorm has enormous consequences uh, in many ways. So, so those are the two uh, things we're going to look at. Malaria, which we consider exogenous, and seed varieties, which we consider exogenous. If you um, go from zero percent of your crops pr planted in a high variety, high yield varieties to 100%, uh, you would reduce your total fertility by one kid, controlling for these other factors, which we would argue are not really exogenous. So they're, in a way, over-controlled. So to sum up so far, uh, female literacy and income level don't seem to matter much in our, ver in our models, even though those are classic variables in the demographic transition literature. 50% um, higher usage of modern variety crops would reduce the total fertility rate by half a kid. Um, child survival effects are big. Well, lower bound would be that having child mortal mortality would reduce total fertility by almost a kid, and their upper bound estimate would be ha ha having, halving, how do you pronounce that? Um, child mortality, uh, infant mortality, would reduce the total fertility rate by two and a half kids. So basically, what would happen in, col in, in colonialism or imperialism, boat would come, people would get off the boat, uh, a lot of them died, then they said, this is not a good place, and they would leave, and, or they would be dead, other people wouldn't come. They found that they survived and prospered, then they would stay, and they would develop uh, uh, colonies and so forth, and have a, a, a larger Western population living there. Uh, 
they, just as everyone following me, so the settler mortality rate they show is negatively correlated with institutions, the institution index I showed you before, hundreds of years later, 200 years later. So uh, the brilliance of their, ar their or the, the apparent brilliance of their argument is that settler mortality, i.e. white people's mortality, was uncorrelated with local adult mortality. So they rule out the story that it's health, it's the global distribution of mortality that is driving this and saying, no, 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 see, it's not the health of the locals. It's not that just this is a less healthy place in general. And, uh, and that's what's explaining this otherwise spurious correlation between institutions and economic development and settlers. It's uniquely settler mortality, not local mortality. And it's uncorrelated. What are these fleshy white folks getting off the boats like? They're like babies. They have not been exposed to the, the, the local uh, uh, microbial biological community, and there th th it turns out, well, why don't you correlate the settlers' mortality with infant or child mortality, and you'll get a much higher correlation. And in turn, you see that these institutions that they talk about as so causal are very correlated with uh, fertility and infant mortality. <laughs> Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.